Hi, I'm Ian McLeod. I'm here to do some reading at Nikki's request for the museum from the Book of History here. And uh, I'm excited to do it because nobody's really ever asked me to read anything before except my kids and a few school teachers over the years. So this is new for me, which is kind of nice. Um, I first came up to the valley in 1968, and uh, I'd grown up in Victoria. I was fairly young then, uh, 17 actually. Uh, I got off the train and I thought, wow, did they ever put the train station in a bad part of town? <laughs> it didn't take me long to figure out that was the entire town. <laughs> one floor. But, there was nothing but gravel roads, and uh, I forget how many inhabitants. It reminded me of one of the movies where they cross out when somebody dies and rewrite the number. I think it was 97 or something in the village. Um, it was very small, but the, it was a wonderful place. And by the end of the first day, everybody knew who I was and where I came from. I met quite a few people, and um, I just I kind of fell in love with the place. It was uh, unique for me. I, uh, I'd grown up in a very big town and all of a sudden here's this little town where everybody knew each other. And when they had a party, everybody had to go. Otherwise you didn't have enough for a party. And the little teeny community hall that we had then was, uh, would hold everybody. That's how small it was in those days. So it's changed a lot, and um, a lot of the changes have uh, come about because of what I'm going to read here today about the railroad and the highway com coming in and the log going on and lots more people moving here. Whistler, of course, made a big um, change with a huge amount of employment. This chapter is called The Arrival of the Railway and Logging. As early as 1891, men incorporated a company to build a railway from the coast to Pemberton and beyond. But not until 1914 did a train run into the valley. This delay prolonged the hardships of isolation. By pack train from Squamish, charges and freight ran as high as three cents a pound. Isolation increased in winter when depths of snow closed the trails except to travel on snowshoes. In such circumstances, the able-bodied could still reach the coast. The ailing were completely cut off from help they might need. Finally, the plans of two promoters resulted in the laying of the first tracks north from Squamish. As early as 1905, James Cavers Gill then Reeve of North Vancouver, and Arthur McAvoy, a lawyer, had dreamed of a railway to tap the country north of Howe Sound, primarily the fertile Pemberton Meadows country. Later, with Pemberton Landover, landowner J.W. McFarland, W.E. Burns, and J.C. Keith, a well-known financier, they served on the board of the Howe Sound, Pemberton Valley and Northern Railway. In 1907, when the company was incorporated, its railway was only one of several planned to head north towards Pemberton. Most promoters envisaged their trains reaching Fort George, or points beyond that settlement. For two years, the company kept secret the fact that the engineering firm of Cleveland and Cameron had surveyed a reasonable grade through the Chequemus Canyon. By 1909, when the feasibility of HS, PV, and N construction made headlines in the Daly Province, the railway company had bought most of the Tidewater land in Squamish. In Pemberton, the company had bought the Neal Ranch, which was originally owned by John Curry, as well as the Miller land on both sides of Miller Creek. In 1911, the promoters bought land Tom Greer had preempted, and possibly more. One source gives the company's Pemberton holdings as 2,000 
930 acres. In the beginning, the railway men planned to build their road to haul out the timber up the Squamish Valley, but their charter provided for construction from the Squamish River right through to Lillowick on the Fraser, about 120 miles distant. By the end of 1907, 10 miles of the line had been surveyed. By the end of 1909, the nearly 60 miles to Pemberton. In 1909, crews laid rails heading towards the Chifai River, another promising development. Two Baldwin locomotives were on their way to Squamish for service on the new railway. Although initially the few miles of track, including branch lines, served just as a logging road, the directors expected to haul varied freight, timber all along the line, copper gold ores from the Green Lake mines, and fruit, vegetables, and livestock from the Lillowick and Pemberton. Meanwhile, the railway company's subsidiary, the Howe Sound and Northern Development Company, managed the land. This company planned two town sites that in Squamish would be called Newport. The Pemberton town site, Agerton, was part of District Lot 164 and lay close to the Lillowick River, much of it on land Neil had recently farmed, and the site extended to below the one-time Red Ridge area. The company subdivided the remainder of the old farm, 74 lots, each containing from 5 to 10 acres, were offered at prices ranging from 100 to 150 an acre. Similarly, the company divided the former Miller property right, into farm-sized acreages. Eustace Bubb, an English immigrant, was land agent in Pemberton. The representative for Europe was based in Glasgow. The tiny settlement that had developed close to the planned station site centered at the corner where the Pemberton Farm Road joins the main road linking Upper and Lower Valley. There, William Kiltz built the present Patnon Home to serve as both store and post office. Nearby, he erected a large house and a barn. Eustace Bubb, for his own use, had the Miller House floated down the Lillowick and dragged up to where it stands today, the home of Miller Shones. This house now stands at the Pemberton Museum, if you want to come and look at it. The Howe Sound and Northern Railway Company, as it came to be known, never did extend its 12 miles of line or complete any other developments. It lacked provincial government backing, and in March 1912, Pemberton people heard that the government had entered into an agreement with Foley, Welch, and Stewart to build a railway from Squamish to Fort George. A new company, the Pacific Great Eastern Railway Company, received the government aid the Howe Sound Company had petitioned for and had hoped for. In 1913, a rail link with the coast would solve not only difficulties of travel, but also other serious penalties of isolation. The lack of a school and the inability to control streams prone to flooding. Only more settlement could warrant establishment of a school. Only a modern transportation system could move in the heavy equipment needed to safeguard the valley against floods. Hopes of far-reaching benefits depended on rails. For Pemberton people, the first real evidence of the Pacific Great Eastern's determination to extend the Howe Sound and Northern Line came with the building of a rough road from Squamish, a road needed for teams working on construction and for hauling supplies of all kinds. Raised on a farm in Quebec, Alan Fraser traveled the new road, butchering cattle for the construction camps. But before starting down the steepest hills, he tied himself to his Democrat wagon. Frank Buckley and Ray Elliott herded the cattle to the camps. As these men worked along the tote road, they met the general public moving between Squamish and Pemberton, and between Pemberton and Anderson Lake. 
once construction started, travelers had a wider choice of stopping places. They could spend the night at railway camps. When Faye Brokaw and Gladys Blakeway rode south from Pemberton, Faye armed with a revolver, they stayed overnight at one of them. Many travelers saw Martha Phillip working with her father and her brothers, the Tapleys, while Alec Phillips earned money in Vancouver to support them all. They were building Rainbow Lodge to be ready to receive guests from the first fisherman's special train. Finally, the first train from Squamish reached Pemberton and reached the station platform that was a structure of rough planks in a sea of roots. On October 29, 1914, that general roughness was of little concern to settlers boarding the first passenger train south. For the Joseph Ronan family, travel had been transformed since the year before when they had made the rugged trip in by way of Lytton and Lillard. On his first trip out by train, James Lansgrove gave one of the trainmen a two-dollar tip. Reaching all the lake, the train made an overnight stop, and there, for one dollar, Lansgrove shared a double bunk in the boarding house, which was a converted sawmill. Six days after the departure of the first passenger train, weather conditions allowed the music of a steam locomotive's whistle to penetrate to the upper valley, a signal of Pemberton that entered the age of the railway and was facing a whole new way of life. Packers on the Pemberton Trail, like Elliott, Greer, Mahan, Perkins, Thorne, Wallace, and Williams, were forced to find new careers, as well as increased incomes, with all the comforts and conveniences those could supply. Just imagine the excitement of a railway coming. When you see how excited people are today with fiber optics. <laughs> we already have internet. <laughs> you imagine that there's just the difference from a trail to a railroad. All of a sudden, I, I can't. I, I just can't. You know, I think you'd have to live through it. The Pacific Great Eastern Railway. Its whistles and horns have echoed through this valley for 40 years. For a very long time, it was almost a joke. Its service was so bad, and its cars smoky and uncomfortable. The people of Pemberton would have laughed more often if they had not been so dependent on it. But there is no other way in or out of the valley. The PGE, sometimes nicknamed the Please Go Easy, was and still is the lifeline from Vancouver to northern British Columbia. But now, in the last year, the passenger trains have become sleek new cars, and they're even beginning to run on time. Now there's a kind of reluctant pride in the old PGE. Soon they will have two passenger trains a day, one up and one down. When they arrive, there's a brief flurry of activity, and then everything's quiet again. Now, the business and logging community, this next chapter here, Pemberton Village in the 40s was still quite small, with all its businesses on the main street, community hall, Taylor's Garage, Telford Store, the hotel, and Prendergast log cabin facing the station agent's house, the section house, as now, at the end of the road, and the opposite end across from the hall. Jack Telfer's garage, and later Joe and Mary Telfer's new home, and behind the first very modest Legion building, by the, by the railroad was a small cabin used by the forestry during summer months a couple of old log cabins and bunk houses where the unmarried members of the section crew lived. The next large business expansion came in the mid-sixties when the road became more than a rumor and daring souls were dodging the highway crews to drive in from the city. Well, that's better. 
At the Pemberton Hotel, new owners Tom and Helen Allen, in partnership with their two sons, Larry and Dale, embarked on an expansion program which transformed the small frame hotel with its very basic services into a modern building with a coffee shop, dining room, cabaret, attended to the end of Frontier Street for the old Prendergast cabin had met its end by fire and the residence built by former hotel owner Frank Caracello had been moved to a new site in the village. The old Brotherston and McNally garage underwent remodeling and renovations to become Pemberton's first drugstore. Opening for business in May 1964 with Bob and Pat Priest moving into the apartment above the store with their four children. Warren Telfer, who had built a new hardware store early in the 60s, expanded his premises in 1964 to include a coin-operated laundromat, four washers, two dryers. The first business of its kind in the community. It proved very popular with both Pemberton and Mount Curry residents, doubling its size in only a few years. The taxi service in Pemberton, started by the Taylor's Pemberton Express underwent many changes. Earl Rivet and wife Norma ran a taxi service out of Pemberton, and Jerry Boulanger operated out of Mount Curry. Bob Matthews consolidated and expanded the service with two cars and radio communications, the bulk of his business being the run between Pemberton and Mount Curry. The unprecedented expansion of Pemberton both the village and surrounding area during the 50s and 60s was a result of a number of factors. The opening up of new farmland and improvement of existing farms because of the drainage project. The improved services brought by the BC Electric and the BC Telephone. The completion of the railroad and later the road to Vancouver. And most of all, the start of the logging industry which later took the place of farming as the main income base of the valley. Apart from the Blackwater Timber Mill at Devine, operated by Andy Devine, logging operations in the 40s were restricted to small sawmills, one-horse logging outfits, and pole cutting. George Walker and Bill Spetch went into partnership in a sawmill in 1945 and were typical of the operators of that era. George ran the mill, assisted during the summer months by his brothers and fathers, who later ran the planer. Bill, a great horseman and an expert in training a team, ran the logging end. The trees, mostly fir, were hand felled with six and a half foot crosscut saws, which required the energy of two husky men. John Punch, the axe expert, hewed out the trails for the teams and sniped the logs, sharpening the ends to a point so that they would travel more easily down the hillside and along the skid road. Skinners like Victor Frank and Seymour Wallace handled the teams expertly. Teams so trained that when they felt the tension on the chain slacken, they would leap to one side as the loosened logs shot down the mountainside and the torn out dogs rattled on the end of the chains. Once on the flat, the logs were too heavy for the teams, unless on a skid road built of small logs lying crossways. Barkers were not so essential then because the bark was cleaner without the embedded stones. Typical of bulldozed logs. George Walker purchased his last team of horses as late as 1952 for $500. A champion lead pair from a team of Clydesdales that had competed in exhibition across Canada, they weighed between 17 and 1800 pounds each and proved their worth in the woods. It was possible in the days of horse logging to buy a team, train and use them for a year, then sell them for as much as or more than they had cost. And that, commented one old horse logger, is more than you can do with a skipper. And the woods were quieter then. And though nobody made a fortune, most made a reasonable living. 
cedar pole cutting went on side with the fir logging, similar methods being used to haul the poles out of the woods. Among the pole men were Bud and Dan Fraser and the Fowler boys, Leonard and Lori, the latter a very husky young man who would often drag out a pole when he came down the hillside for his lunch. Pole cutters came and went. Two or three men would take a contract, having first successfully bid for a pole gun. Fell, them and peel cedar trees, young and straight enough to pass inspection, and then ship them out to make a large or small profit. If the latter, they would complain bitterly of the market or the unfairness of the government scaler and move on to some other job. Many farmers, like Lukey Van Bean, Ron Roman and Ben Kay were able to supplement their farm income with poles cut on their own land or obtained a short distance away. By 1949, when Bud Fraser, Charlie Wallace, and Vern Lundstrom were pole cutting on the hillsides above Lola Lake, the two man chainsaw was coming into general use. These saws were as long as the old crosscut saws and weighed over 100 pounds. Around the same time, Wally Wagner, Jack Matthews, and Jerry Wolf were logging fur using a spar tree, the lines powered by a donkey motor to bring the logs together in piles on the hillside. An A-frame mounted on a log raft was used to pull the logs into the water, and they were floated to the end of the lake to be shipped by road to the Creekside Railway Spur, and thence to Vancouver. The pole cutters on the lake used a similar method. During this same period, a number of small sawmills operated in the Upper Valley. Hines and Sword were later sold out to Wolf Dyson. Roger Dickey on the Caribou Road south of the Birkenhead River. Arthur the Varge in the Darth Sea area. Gunnar Kemps in the Birken District and Miller Creek Watershed. Tony McCady near Creekside, and John Ronan in Pemberton Meadows. By the early 50s, Tony McCady, in partnership with Bill Brotherston and Harvey McNally, was working near Miller Creek. Joe Antonelli near Tisdale, and Ed Morgan in the Bergen Head District near the old fish hatchery. Some worked from their homes, and others operated from small camps set up in the bush. Up the narrow, twisting Sioux Valley, road travelers today can see the remnants of a small camp. The rusting skeletons of two trucks almost hidden in the underbrush, the cleared space where the sawmill stood, and the old high graying stumps are all that is left to show that men once lived and worked here. Falling trees with crosscut saws, yarding of the donkey ends in their spar tree, and trucking their loads to the railroad. 10 miles away. From the railroad, they would collect their groceries and machine parts and drive back to their only camp. Starting in the late 50s, Danny and Mabel Franks ran a sawmill, two shade mills, and three shingle mills, the last two operations being destroyed by fire in the mid 60s. Financed at different times by Vancouver Warehousing, Tyee Forest Products, and Robson Plywood, Frank's mill continued off and on into the late 60s. John Coslitz worked as bookkeeper, Ray Sankey in the office, Magnus Erdahl at both construction work and in the mill, and A. Danny Luck as a sawyer. The first shingle mill in Pemberton was built by Dick Green in partnership with Harry Weber and Emery Doyson. Emery's sister Terry worked side by side with the men and put in a man's day, the men. The arrival of the Fleetwood Logging Company around 1950 signaled the start of big time logging in Pemberton. Fleetwood set up a camp on the upper end of Lillivet Lake, built a bridge and some roadway, and used crawler tractors to supplement the spar trees and A-frame. By 1956, George Walker had left his sawmill and with Howard Anderson and Fleetwood formed the new company of Cascade Fur Logging, working first at Tisdale along the Green River and later at various locations 
including One Mile Creek, Mosquito Lake, Uri Creek, Ryan Creek, Kirstead Creek, and Rutherford Creek. The first steel bars bar in Pemberton was brought in by Cascade Fir, and the steel spar for the other heavy machinery transformed logging in Pemberton. The higher slopes of the hillsides could be reached by bulldozed roads, the new lighter chainsaws could be operated by one man, and the steel spar could be set up in a matter of hours as opposed to the two days needed to prepare a spar tree. Soon Anglo-Canadian forest products, earlier known as Gillespie Logging and later as Van West, had started operations on the south side of Green River at the foot of Mount Curry, and Empire Mills was working near Tisdale. The loggers were everywhere. The woods screeched with high-pitched wine of the power saws, bare patches appeared on the mountain sides, and logging trucks raised clouds of dust on the gravel highways. Side by side with the giants worked the smaller, usually locally based outfits. Liberal Brothers, who started near Darcy and later moved to the slopes of O'Brien Creek. Perkins Brothers, mainly in the Upper Valley. Talbot's Logging on the slopes near Miller Creek. Larry Hamill in the Sioux Valley. Others, like Lizard Logging and Crivier and Schenkel, flourished only briefly. Mount Curry contractors were operated by two valley raised men, Len Fowler and Pete Shore. Jim Collins, who turned from farming to pole cutting in the early 50s, was later to join Pete in order to form the CNS Logging Company. As well as the Creekside Spur, logs were loaded at three loading yards near Pemberton Station. The coming of the road in 1965 saw the first logs being shipped directly by the Log Brothers, and from that time on, more and more logs were trucked from Pemberton to Squamish. Though most of the wood shipped was fur, in the early 60s, Scott Paper Company began buying cottonwood, which was shipped directly by road to New Westminster. Large scale logging brought full employment to the young men of the district at least in the summer months, a profitable alternative to farming, and much more money in the village. Derry McEwen opened a small repair shop specializing in chainsaws and service. New families moved into the district to work for logging companies or in the subsidiary occupations like truck driving and machinery repair. Between 1951 and 1966, the population of the area, excluding the reserves, increased from 250 to 768. The expansion of the logging industry brought more forestry personnel. Prior to 1958, it was customary for an assistant forest ranger from the Squamish Ranger Station to spend the summer months in Pemberton. A small cabin constructed on the PGE right away served as both home and office until the building of the warehouse and residence in 1957. The next year, Jack Paradise took over his duties as the first forest ranger in charge of the Pemberton area. As the forest industry expanded further, assistant rangers were appointed and another residence was built. Fire suppression crews of university students occupied a camp run by Al Staley with his wife Marty, who was cook, and often with a local girl hired to help her. Later, many of the hillsides denuded by logging operations would be planted by crews working either on contract or directly under the Forest Service. The new logging roads have already made new areas more accessible, but the backwoods are little changed, and the hillsides denuded by the loggers now provide space and air for wild fruit.
pair of trawlers on a flimsy springboard as they hacked out an undercut in rhythmic strokes for as long as three days has given way to the chatter of the gasoline chainsaw. Within as short a time as 10 minutes, the tree comes down. of logging have revolutionized the life of the logger and the tradition of single men and bunkhouses has been replaced by the permanent community. These are the loggers of today, living with and caring for the forests of tomorrow. The old timer would find it hard to believe that some loggers belong to the Board of Trade. There's no similarity between the so-called romantic logger and today's scientific log harvester. <laughs> 